Hello, and welcome to my new podcast called Freedom from the Struggle. My name is Anthony Corelli, and I'm a retired minister and therapist who also happens to be the author of a little trilogy of books called The Struggle Series. These books are about spiritual warfare, and although they're mostly fiction, I have taken the time to weave in some real stories of my time as a deliverance minister. But honestly, this podcast isn't about those books. This podcast is for those who are struggling with spiritual warfare and demonic attack. This is a place for you to call in and receive practical teaching and deliverance ministry interventions, as well as a lot of love and a whole lot of prayer. We want this to be a safe place where you're believed. So if you're a fan of the paranormal or a Christian, please note, this isn't a place for debate on theological issues or spiritual theories. This is a place for people to be loved and treated with respect, and most importantly, receive deliverance, freedom from the struggle, if you will. Now, who am I? Well, I'm somebody who struggled with spiritual warfare from a very young age. I can remember the first time I saw a demon. I was four years old in my grandmother's living room, staring at a demon through her picture window. And although I wouldn't have known to call it a demon, I knew its intentions towards me were not good. I knew it was evil. I can remember being about five years old the first time that a demon came out of my closet in my bedroom and stood at the foot of my bed for hours. And this happened almost every night of my life for years. Now, this demon was in the form of a shadow being, but the inside of the demon was not dark or black. It was kind of like static. You know, I'm a 70s kid, and I remember falling asleep with the TV on, and when you'd wake up and it had that white snow, that was the substance of this demon. So although I couldn't see its face, I could feel its evil. And one time, maybe years later, that demon decided to move from the foot of my bed to the side of my bed. And it leaned over to me. And although I couldn't see its eyes, I could see the abyss of black that were where his eyes were supposed to be. It was empty and it was dark and it was evil. And that demon spoke to me and it said, you are not special. You are not loved. God doesn't love you. And those words scarred my soul. You see, I was a lonely kid, kind of neglected, and I needed to know that Jesus loved me. Thank God my parents took me to a Catholic church, and I can remember sitting in the pew, staring up at the altar, looking at that crucifix on the wall, and praying, Jesus, if you're real, I need your help. And I can tell you throughout my life, I have prayed that prayer over and over again. And Jesus has helped me. He has guided me through some of the darkest times of my life. Honestly, places I've put myself, sins I've committed that are so atrocious that it sometimes even shocks me. And so I want this place to be real, where you can tell your stories, where you can believe that you're believed and not judged. That's what this podcast is about, because trust me, I've been where you've been, and I'm not going to judge you. If the judging starts, honestly, I'm the first one that's going to take the lightning bolt. So this podcast, we need to discuss the concept of demons. Who are the demons? Now, we'll touch this more in episode two, but I want you to understand that my theology on demons might be different than yours. And that's okay because in reality, we're not really going to know the truth until we get to the other side. But this is what I believe through years of study and most importantly, through my time helping others with these attacks. Now, I believe that the demons are not the fallen angels that fell with Satan in the rebellion. Most Christians would believe that's who they are. And again, I'm not saying that I disagree or agree um, with your theology. What I'm saying is, is that I've done a lot of study and I believe these creatures called demons are a different form of being. 
We learn in the book of Genesis chapter 6 that there was evil all over the world. And this race of angels that had come down from heaven had chosen to sin with human women. And through that sin, they bred with human women and created this hybrid form of beings called the Nephilim. And the Nephilim we hear were giants, men of renown. And these giants were corrupt. Some extra canonical texts will say that they were cannibals, that they were very evil people, very evil creatures, if you will. And we hear that God saw this evil and made the decision to wipe out the earth with the flood and only save mankind through the blood of one man, Noah. Now, what would make God wipe out an entire race of people? There must have been evil so abundant that it was necessary. Now, what happened to these Nephilim who were killed in the flood? I believe they weren't allowed into heaven because they were sinful and they were an abomination. And although the angels that sinned were sent to a very dry place, we hear, to be locked in chains till a time of judgment with the other angels that fell in the rebellion. These Nephilim, I believe, were cursed to roam the earth. And that's who we call demons today. Why is this important? Because when you understand the motivation of a demon, you can understand why you're experiencing the torment. You see, when a demon decides that it's going to take you down, that it's going to kill, steal, and destroy, as we hear in John chapter 10, verse 10, it means business. These demons are methodical. They are patient. And more importantly, they want nothing but your destruction. So they will do anything in their power to destroy you, to tear you apart from the inside. The good news is, is that God loves us. He covers us and protects us. Because honestly, without that protection, the demons would kill us instantly, and that would be that. Even people who aren't believers still receive that covering because God loves us so much. So what happens is these demons have to obtain permission into our lives. Actually, they have to obtain a series of permissions. Picture it like a door. When you open the door with a key, there's another door, and you open that door with the key. And eventually, these demons will receive enough keys or enough permissions to be on the inside. We would call that possession. But as these demons obtain permissions from us, they get closer and closer to the internal workings of our life. And that's when I received a lot of calls as my time as a deliverance minister. Several doors in, these people were crying out for help. And having to walk them through who the demons were and how they obtained these permissions was always a difficult task. But what I did learn is that judgment and calling out their sin didn't help. Pointing them to the love and grace of Jesus Christ is what got them to see how they got there and how to renounce those permissions, how to renounce those spirits, how to renounce Anything they've welcomed into their life, intentionally or unintentionally, help them to receive deliverance. And that's what we want to cover here. Now, I said in chapter two or episode two of this podcast, we will discuss who the demons are more in detail. What I want to do now is kind of discuss spiritual warfare a little bit. Now, I want you to picture in your mind especially those who are paranormal enthusiasts. There's these new tools now where you can uh, purchase a camera or even put software on your phone that'll allow you to see in different light spectrums. And if you watch any of the paranormal shows on television, sometimes you'll see uh, beings or different shapes that look like beings come through in different light spectrums. And I actually believe that that, that is true. I actually believe that when you can see into different light spectrums, you can actually see other beings that we don't see with our normal eyes. 
Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and some of you are more scientific than me, but I've heard that it's as little as 1% of the light spectrum that human beings can see in. Maybe a little higher, I don't know, but that's just something I heard. 1% of the light spectrum only allows you to see what we would consider reality. But honestly, if you could see in, let's say, 50% of the light spectrum, you would see a whole lot more than you see now. I always hear that and equate that to seeing into the spirit realm. Some people have the ability to see a little more through the veil than others. Fortunately and unfortunately, I'm one of those people. Sometimes I see things that I don't want to see. And although I believe it's a gift from God, sometimes it feels like a curse. But when I've seen through that spectrum, I've seen evil. I've stared it in the face. And it's awful. It's terrifying. And I see the intent in the faces of these demons. They hate us. And that's spiritual warfare. Let's use a hypothetical story. Let's say that you have a five-year-old boy and he is bright and intelligent. He's kind and compassionate and loving. He's always got a smile on his face and his parents look at that child and they say, wow, there's something special about this kid. And fast forward till this child is 17. He's now into the occult. He's very angry. He's very bitter. He doesn't have that spark in his eyes anymore. And people will always say, what happened to that child? Now, without posting blame, it's obvious for me to see that a series of permissions were obtained by a demonic force to weave their way into that child's life to change him from who God created him to be. To me, that's spiritual warfare. And believe it or not, demons although we hate to give them credit, they're more intelligent than us. They see what our weaknesses are more than we see them. They see what our strengths are more than we see them. And they create a plan, a scheme, if you will. And maybe there's one demon assigned to you and a series of helper demons that are on with the cause. And what they'll do is they'll destroy you from the inside out. They'll obtain a series of permissions to take that giftedness that God gave you and put it on the back burner and to create a person who you don't even recognize anymore. That's spiritual warfare. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't call me until it's so far progressed that it's something you'd see in a movie, but they don't really recognize it when it's early on. And so in my hypothetical story, that 17 year old boy is going to have to take the time to understand how he got there. What series of permissions were obtained to get him to be this person that even he doesn't like that his family struggles with. Well, in a metaphor, that's what we all struggle with. If your strength is shining bright, You can be proud of that because God created you to be that way. But the demons also see that light and they also want to squash it. They want to snuff it out. And that's what spiritual warfare is. You were designed to be something amazing for God. He created you in a special way. He gifted you in a way that nobody else is gifted for his purpose. And to be honest, for your enjoyment for your joy. Because when we line ourselves up with God's purpose for our lives, we're happier beings. We're happier people. But the devil and his demons want to take that away from you. And so throughout this podcast, as we hear stories of spiritual warfare, I want us to remember that these people don't call me on the first time that they've had an issue. By the time they call me, this has progressed for months, years, maybe even decades. And so we want to love on these people. We don't want to judge them. It's easy to point out sin. And as I said earlier, if we're pointing out sin, you better point at me first. Because as a wise woman once said, if you're not the worst sinner you know, you don't know yourself. And I believe in that theory. 
And so we're not here to judge. We're here to love. Now, let me tell you another story from my childhood. Once upon a time, I think I was about eight years old and my sister was about five. And we had this crazy closet that I told you about earlier where this demon would come through the closet. But this was an older house that was kind of small, and so they maximized space by creating one closet in between the primary bedroom and the other bedroom, which was my bedroom. And as my sister was born, we both shared that bedroom. And so we would love to play in that room in the day. At night, it was scary, but in the day, it was fine. And so one day, I was telling her the stories of the demon that came through the closet. And as terrifying as that was in the day, it didn't seem so scary. So as I told her the story, somehow a challenge came, a dare came through our conversation that we would walk in the closet through my door in the dark, and we would exit through my parents' closet door on the other side. Now, keep in mind, this closet was not very long at all. I would estimate it to maybe be five or six feet in length, maybe seven. And so as we walked in our door and we closed the door, we started to walk forward. Now it was dark, but you could see light under the door, so it wasn't pitch black. And so we could easily tell that we were going from the light underneath my door to the light in my parents' door. And as we walked forward, It didn't take long to realize that we weren't making progress. Even as a child, this should have only maybe been seven or eight, maybe 10 steps tops. But we walked and we walked and we walked and we couldn't get to the other side. And terror began to set in because I realized the mistake I had made. I knew that demon lived in there or at least dwelled in there. And I knew I shouldn't have been in there, but there I was. And so here's what happened. We began to cry. We began to panic. We reached up and touched both sides to make sure that there was clothes on both sides to know we were walking in the same direction. But we couldn't get to where we needed to be. So we made a decision to turn around and start walking the other way. And we walked and we walked and we walked and we still couldn't find a door. And the panic set in and the terror set in in a way that I can't describe. I'm 52 years old and I remember it like it was yesterday. And so we begin to scream and cry and scream louder and cry louder. And eventually the door flung open and it was my mother. And she scooped us both up by our arms like they did back in those days. And she said, what the heck is going on? And we explained to her that we decided to walk through the closet and that we couldn't find our way out. And that as we were in that closet, we heard laughter and demonic growling. And my mother's decision at that moment was to blame me. And I received a spanking and a lecture to not scare my sister. And I can remember when she left the room, my sister said she was sorry because she knew it wasn't me. And I definitely knew it wasn't me. But in that moment, I also knew that I was on my own. I knew that I couldn't reach out to the adults for help. Because, as you know, kids get told, it's just your imagination. It was just a nightmare. Go back to sleep. And I don't fault my mother because that's what all parents do. But I do wish that I would have had the help that I needed. So I tell that story because if you're somebody who's been there and you've reached out for help, you have found yourself in a place where you need somebody to believe you, but you can't. Well, guess what? This is that place. I'm going to suspend all disbelief and I'm going to try my best to understand where you've been And I might understand more than most because I've been there. But honestly, if I don't, I'm going to do my best to try. 
Now, let me tell you another story. This is a story from later on in life. This is a story I wrote about in my first book called The Struggle. And the, the story, again, is very, very, very fictional. But I did weave in some real stories. And a real story that happened to me when I first began work as a vocational minister we had a family that reached out to our church for help. They said that they were struggling with demonic attacks in their home. Now, I'll be honest with you, as a minister, you get a lot of people that their diagnosis may be more closely um, worded as mental illness than it is actual spiritual attack. So you're not really sure until you know. So me and the senior pastor, got in our cars after uh, a long day at, at the church and we went over maybe about 7 p.m. And as we walked into this house, I walked up into the living room and as you walked in, you can look straight up and see the loft. So they had this loft set up as a playroom for one of their small children. And in that playroom was a tent. And to be honest, I don't remember the cartoon figures on the tent, but it might have been like a Barbie tent or a fairy tent or something like that. And I watched a demonic creature come out of that tent and it was huge. So I knew it was supernatural and not somebody in a costume because something that big couldn't have fit into that tiny tent. And as I stared up, I knew exactly that these people were telling the truth. I knew exactly what they were dealing with. However, the senior pastor didn't believe him. And as she told her story of having little bites on their arms and hearing voices and seeing shadows, he quickly latched on to the bed bug theory and went up in their room and asked to pull their sheets back and search for bed bugs. And to make a long story short, he told her he would say a quick prayer for her, but that she needed to call an exterminator. And we left. And on the way back to the church in my car, he looked over at me and he said, what's wrong? And I said, there's a demon in that house. I saw it. And he chuckled and he said, you don't really believe that stuff exists, do you? And I became angry and I said, oh, I'm sorry. The Bible tells us Jesus prayed demons out of people. But now that you're on earth, I guess they've all fled in fear. And you can see that he was angry, but more importantly, he didn't like being challenged. And so I dropped him off at his car and we kind of left everything unspoken. And I did go back and I did help those people. And that's a story for another time in another place. But what I want you to understand is a lot of people who struggle with demonic oppression will even go to the church and receive that kind of treatment. I want you to picture in your mind what it was like for that woman to come to our church and ask for help. What interventions had she tried? What had she done on her own before she realized she couldn't do this on her own? Not only as Christians, not only do we sometimes minimize what people are going through, but sometimes we lecture them or make it their fault. This podcast isn't going to be like that. I can promise you. We are going to do our best to just help you tell your story in a safe place and in a way that you can be completely transparent. I'll be the gatekeeper. If people want to call and be judgmental, I'll be the one that stops them. Because until we know where somebody's been, we can't judge them. And as the Bible says, you should judge people as you want to be judged. Because we're all sinners. and We all fall short of the glory of God. And so this isn't a place to call out sin. Although sin is evident, people know how they got there. People know which permissions they gave. This is not about judgment. This is about pointing them to grace. And that's what we will do here. Now, one last story. And I want you to hear this story through the eyes of a minister who has seen evil. I have seen 
objects lift off of a desk and slam into a wall. I have seen demons in people, latched on to people. I have seen people be transformed from kind, loving people to angry, violent um, attackers of people they loved. And I know the source, but I also know how they got there. And I'm going to tell you the story of someone that I know, somebody who accidentally found themselves in a place like this. Now, I know a person who decided they wanted to use a conjuring mirror. Even somebody like me who understands the paranormal very well, I, I'll be honest, I always kind of minimized um, a lot of the devices or tools that people use to quote unquote conjure demons. So I was pretty unfamiliar at the time with what a conjuring mirror was, but this person would sit in front of a mirror and they would try to conjure a demon. Now, I was unaware of this at the time, although this was a friend, because we weren't really living the lives of Christians at the time. And this person, I guess, from their uh, later tellings of the story, would sit there and ask a demon to come into their life and give them the things they wanted. You know, a boyfriend, a um, lot of money success, that type of thing. And she was a friend who I considered, um, you know, maybe acquaintance, but definitely more than just the typical acquaintance, but I didn't know her well. But one day I got a call from this person and she said to me, are you still working as a minister? And I said, well, yeah, of course I am. That's what I'm doing full time now because she knew me when I was a a therapist full-time and a minister part-time. So she said, I need your help. And I went to her house and I said, what's going on? And she said, I have to be honest with you. That mirror right there, a demon came out of it and it's trying to get inside of me. And so it took me a while to understand what she was talking about. Because again, I was pretty... Um, uh, lacking in knowledge of what a conjuring mirror was. So she had to explain it to me. And my first instinct was to say, what in hell are you doing? Why would you do that? And I watched the defeat in her face. I will never again make that mistake. Because although I helped her, and it took a handful of interventions. She's doing much better now. I actually don't talk to her much anymore, but I do know that her life has completely turned around. Very devout uh, woman of faith. But I vowed to myself that when I help people, I will never blame them. I will never make that the focal point of what we're doing. So as you join me on this journey in this podcast, please know that I've made that mistake and I will do everything in my power not to make it again. I want you to be happy here. I want you to feel that when you're done telling your story, that not only have we helped you move past your spiritual struggles, but that you were finally loved on and believed in. So as we work towards mapping out our next episodes, let me just tell you this. Jesus loves you. He's not mad at you. He saw everything you did. What he wants you to do is turn to him as you are. You don't have to be perfect. As a matter of fact, you can't be perfect. He just wants you to come to him and let him love on you. And you'll be amazed at how the things in you that you're ashamed of, he's already forgiven. And we're going to work towards teaching you how to give everything to him and how he will take that from you. So again, we're going to pray in just a minute, and I want you to pray with me and begin to form an understanding of who Jesus is. Now, with that being said, let's talk about some practical stuff about this podcast in the future.
This podcast will air every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. The first nine episodes, including this one, we are just simply going to do some practical teaching about demonic activity in spiritual warfare. I want to use this nine weeks to not only teach you, but to begin to gather up some phone calls. So if you have a story of your own and you need help, starting next episode, we're going to find ways for you to call in with your story so we can begin to help you. If you know somebody, we ask that you reach out to them and let them know that there's a podcast that might be able to help them or at least guide them in the right direction. So for the first nine episodes, you'll receive some practical teaching, some challenges in your belief systems, and most importantly, some ways for you to be pointed to the loving grace of Jesus Christ. Now, starting in season two, we will be taking those phone calls, dissecting them, and helping people to find freedom from the struggle. What I want to do now is begin to pray for an audience that isn't really formed. We're going to pray that the right people who need this find this. So let's pray. Jesus, I believe that you are the Almighty. That is you that's conquered sin and death. You were a God that came to earth as a man and you showed us the ways of spiritual warfare. You spoke to demons and made them cower and run away. And God, you told us in your word that you've granted us that power. And so Jesus, I pray that you would begin to reach out to people who need to find a podcast like this. This isn't the only place they could find help, but we pray that you guide them to the place or places that they need to be. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would begin to reach out to people inside of themselves. I pray for people who accidentally stumble on this podcast and didn't know that they needed it. I pray for Christians who have been where these people have been or have a love for these people to be a prayer warrior team for us. And most importantly, God, I pray a hedge of protection around this podcast and the people that will be drawn to it. We know the enemy doesn't like this. We know that he doesn't want people to know the truth of your love. We know that he wants to tear us apart limb from limb. And so God, Father, I pray for your protection. I pray for your knowledge and your wisdom to flow through me, not because I'm anybody, but because I'm simply tuning myself into what you want these people to know. I thank you so much, Father, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, not only for salvation, but for deliverance from the spiritual warfare that will plague our lives from start to finish. Jesus, you taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. And so I pray that you would help us in that journey. God, we love you and we look forward to the ministry that you're going to do here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, I want to thank you for giving us your time. And we hope that you tune in next week at 7 p.m. Central Time as we try to help people find freedom from the struggle. Blessings.